Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Just on the cusp of the afternoon, I love being introduced by John because it gives me the opportunity to tell a story about the first time we met. Um, he was on the phone with his lawyer threatening to sue me uh, for, 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 for an appropriate reason. Uh, this is in the days before there was Crossref, and I was working at Silver Platter, and I had an engineer working on identifying URLs for full text articles. And this engineer was new, and so he wrote a robot to check the URLs, except he didn't put any time lapse between the checking so every millisecond, he was sending a request to the high wire server, uh, which essentially brought it down as a denial of service attack. So understandably, John was upset, and uh, um, we resolved the issue. But um, that's a part of that history there. So this is actually the future of our industry. Uh, computers are going to write the manuscripts. Computers will read the manuscripts. And we can uh, uh, check out and be in the hammock. So a quick overview, I'm going to give a, a, some context for my comments. I'm going to talk about AI and scholarly publishing, some use cases, uh, and uh, mention a couple of issues uh, and conclusions. So as the Greek philosophers said, first know thyself. Uh, what is the, uh, what uh, business are scholarly publishers in? Well, I think of it as a research factory, and that there are inputs to this factory. About 10 million researchers uh, and well, two, two trillion, one point six trillion dollars are going in to the factory. The output of the factory are uh, research results. And as with most factories, how do you tell if what you produced in your factory is any good? You have some sort of QA process. Because every one percent efficiency in your research factory leads to an extra sixteen trillion a uh, million billion dollars. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's more than our whole industry uh, a couple of times, probably. So one way of doing QA is financial controls, but the, that doesn't tell you if the research is relevant, useful, accurate. So how do we do? How do we do, how do, we do quality control on this $2 trillion industry? Well, it's us. It's the journals. The, the, the research results are submitted to us. We either accept them or reject them, and that creates a, a signal uh, uh, to answer questions such as, did the research discover anything new? Was the research done properly? Uh, and, and was the research output in any way useful? And that signal is amplified. So you have the initial publication, then you have citation, and then it's amplified further through uh, impact and altmetric uh, measurements. And this signal goes round and round because people who get a good signal get more funding and, uh, and, the, and, and that cycle uh, continues. Historically, that quality is implied by format. For, so for 300 years, we've had the same format, and that format has implied those signals. But I would say that really underlying that are assertions, assertions that are made by the journal. Who are these authors? Uh, what research did they do? Is that, what's the research actually about? Are the outputs novel? Are the statistics consistent with the results? Were the methods reproducible? Are the data, uh, here are the data uh, generated? Um, and, and how does it link to other research? So these are some of the assertions that we make, albeit very often implicitly through the brand of the journal or the format uh, of the journal. So the journal uh, assertion generation business uh, in a modern context is, is under pressure. Our customers are no longer satisfied. They find those assertions insufficiently granular. Um, they don't like that they're implied rather than explicit. They say they're too slow. We're generating those assertions too slowly. They're too circumscribed. We're only covering a small part of the process. They're too closed. People can't get access to them. They're too late in the process. And just to say something more about that last point, which is we have the same problem that American car manufacturers had in the 70s. We're doing QA at the end of the process. The innovation of the Japanese was to do total quality control and to do QA throughout the process. Um, and, and that's really what our customers are expecting us to do. So, are you in the journal publishing business? Are you in the content publishing business? Well, maybe you're a data company. I would argue one way of looking at this is that we're in the research quality measurement 
uh, business. So journals don't really equal content, they equal assertions. Uh, so in summary, there's this massive uh, spend on re uh, research. Um, publishers are the quality filter to s identify uh, the, the, the signal from the noise. The research article has been the foundation of that service. The bad news is that in a modern context, our customers are dissatisfied. The good news is that there are tools and technologies that will help us solve that problem. And now we come to AI. I apologize for the, the longer introduction. So everyone knows AI is uh, receiving a huge amount of funding. And I, I just want to say that my comments really are related to machine learning rather than other aspects of AI. Uh, of course, China is an increasing player. This is a Financial Times article saying that the citations to AI literature from China are, are now overtaking those uh, uh, from Europe. Um, and here's a quick definition of AI, and I'd like to, to credit uh, Sam Herbert from 67 Bricks uh, for this. AI aims to simulate human intelligence to address complex problems using methods superior to traditional computing approaches. And it's that last bit that is really helpful for us to understand. So AI uses a corpus uh, in general to analyze that corpus, develop a set of rules, and then apply those rules to a new circumstance to generate uh, 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 predictions, analysis, uh, and assertions. Of course, now that the more modern AIs uh, like Alpha, uh, Alpha One from Google uh, that just uh, uh, beat the traditional uh, uh, chess engine Stockfish didn't actually use a corpus at all. It generated its own uh, corpus, if you like. But that's only applicable to um, own analytical problems only. Uh, in, in our business, of course, the corpus is, is very important. So um, the way AI, AI works, if you say, well, uh, should the word cat, how do you order the words cat and fat? The traditional approach is that a computer scientist would write a rule that the adjective comes before the, the noun. Um, the AI approach is to just to examine a lot of content and, and reach that same conclusion. Similarly, the traditional approach, if you are writing a program on how to drive a car, would be to write a rule saying, if you see a stop sign, stop. Uh, or the AI approach would be simply to observe how drivers uh, drive, um, hopefully not in, in Italy or, or somewhere like that, but, uh, uh, and generate rules from that. So you get the idea that it's the computer that writes the rules rather than the software engineer in, in, in your shop. And this transition is, is really well written up in this uh, article about how Google uh, uh, improved its translation uh, software by moving to this corpus-based uh, uh, approach. So um, the process of AI and machine learning uh, is uh, uh, for certain types of problem. Uh, the computers can write the analysis rules more cheaply than humans. Uh, they can then apply those rules uh, and uh, reach uh, uh, scenario, uh, results from new scenarios. So corpus is essential to this. None of this AI that other people are doing works without corpus. And the great news is that we in this room have corpus. The question is, how ready is your corpus? Are you like this fine gentleman here on the right? So we need to improve our corpus, as, as Tim Hall from Stat Reviewer said, we need to meet AIs halfway. So corpus quality has a number of structures, uh, a number of dimensions. One is structure. Uh, and publishers are on top of this. You know, we've got XML tagging, we've got structure in our corpus. Another dimension are identifiers. Now, we're just getting started on this with, with ORCIDs and, and credits and either unique and persistent identifiers. The, the use that an AI can make of a corpus is much better if it has IDs uh, in it. Um, our corpus needs to extend over timeline. People want to do more longitudinal analysis on corpus. What came before the article? What came after the article? Um, and then uh, 
excuse me, just need my glasses here to remind myself, uh, than increasing scope. So are our corpuses too limited? Uh, people want data sets and, and other things included in, in the, the publishing uh, corpus. So my recommendation is, uh, first of all, to monetize your corpus, you need to, uh, we, we need to educate our customers that it's actually expensive to improve the corpus. Uh, and the challenge is, is that the corpus of one publisher is not enough. There needs to be an aggregation. So a walled garden approach for this corpus is not going to work because the reader is the machine. And the business model is likely to be different than selling to, to universities uh, or individual readers. So I think the recommendation is to look for a partner that can offer those network effects of aggregating the corpus across multiple publishers that has economies of scales, that create, can create licensing and legal structures and is, is trustworthy. Now, I, I'm not an, I haven't done a lot of analysis in this area, but I will just mention the uh, right find solution from the Copyright Clearance Center who are already paying out checks to participating publishers who have put their content into this corpus that's used for AI. So we've got a new hammer. Where are the nails? Here are some use cases. So auto-indexing, which is right at the end of the process. The manuscript's been published. It's been indexed. And now we want to attach keywords to it. This was from a presentation by David Smith, IET. They are, for example, using uh, uh, AI to attach keywords. Uh, in a way which uh, they claim is, is at least as good, if not superior, to uh, what humans were doing. But, and this is the classic use case. People think of AI, they think of attaching keywords. But that's only one of a much broader spectrum of uh, points that you can work on. And um, uh, this guy, I assume some of you know, is Gary Kasparov, uh, world chess champion. Uh, and uh, uh, as was just mentioned, he was beaten by Deep uh, Blue, and he, in fact, he was the first victim of post-traumatic AI stress disorder, uh, something we're going to hear a lot more about. He went into a depression after he was beaten by uh, a lump of metal, but he bounced back, and one of the things he did was to organize chess tournaments where computers and chess players combined to play each other. So, uh, and the outcome of that was fascinating, and he's given several talks about this, and I, I recommend you, you look at them. And it's led to, to the Kasparov AI equation, the AI computers and weak human players, but a superior process beats AI computers, strong human players, and an inferior process. And, and if there's one message that you take away from my presentation today, I hope this is it. Superior process is critical because AI is going to be broadly available, and it's those people who apply that AI in the, in the best way are the ones who are going to win, and that means integrating it into workflow. A lot of the initiatives I've seen publishers do have these little pockets of AI of things stuck on the side, but it's not integrated into the workflow where you can make the most of this Kasparov equation. So a, a use case might be, and I'm not saying this is all done, but a use case might be to address this problem of reproducibility that we know is a, a huge issue that's damaging our reputation. So could AI help us look at the methods section of uh, a, a manuscript and generate a reproducibility score? And helping that along is an emerging PID that I mentioned before, persistent identifier, research resource identifiers, so that you can uniquely identify the reagents and materials used uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the research that was undertaken. Or could we derive protocols by doing lookalikes? This protocol looks like another protocol, using AI to maybe generate new protocols or, or match them. The case of finding reviewers has already been mentioned. As you can see, some people are taking it to ex uh, extreme uh, measures. But finding reviewers is much more than content matching. I hear people say, oh, we've got, we can match keywords to find reviewers. But that's not really the problem. The problem is, is the reviewer alive? You know, are, there, are they available? Uh, do they have a conflict of interest? 
And, and humans have been great at doing this, so we need to use AI to assist those screening processes, those finding processes, those contacting processes, and those motivating processes. So integrating that into the workflow is, is, is critical because it's not just about keyword matching. I, uh, it's so important to understand that is what goes on in the journal office. Uh, another AI application that's been mentioned to me by some of the people I interviewed for this talk um, are uh, 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 alt improved altmetrics, uh, uh, mining greater sets of data. Now, predictive evaluations, as you can see, this AI is examining this baby and working out its impact factor or eigenfactor in a few years' time. Um, Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, is, is, as was mentioned before, is really on the case of uh, addressing some uh, key research targets and inv investing a lot of money and they've bought one company called Meta. We've actually integrated Meta into the uh, uh, peer review workflow. Uh, this is a screenshot from actually a live journal, so some of it's blanked out. Uh, there's, a, there's a score given to the manuscript, and when you open up the results, you can see the anticipated citation count, the anticipated impact uh, factor as an eigenfactor for the manuscript, some keyword matches, uh, a journal, uh, matching score as a help to the editor as to whether it's something that they might want to bounce to another uh, journal, uh, and recommended uh, reviewers. Uh, now, we've had this live for about six months in our system. It's virtually free to the journals that use our system. We have about 6,000 journals you use Editorial Manager. Can any of you guess how many journals have been curious enough to actually deploy this live? Anyone? One. Now, I can't understand our industry. We have a, a wonderful opportunity to test AI in a live situation, to find out whether it's useful, to see how it interacts with editors. It's virtually free. It can be activated at the click of a mouse. We should be more proactive in terms of seeing uh, whether this is useful. It's certainly not perfect. But I tell you what, it's going to continue to improve. And there are two reasons why. Chan Zuckerberg has a lot of money, hundreds of millions of dollars. But he's got a bigger motivating factor. He's got a guilty conscience for what happened in 2016. You know what happened in 2016? We had a presidential election in the US that was impacted by social media. He has a guilty conscience. So he is highly motivated to do some good things in the world. Um, it's decision support. It's not replacing editors. Uh, it's a significant uh, uh, and has significant and continuous funding. So the other thing that AI can be used for, it, it, once it's integrated into the process, is to create uh, new audiences. AI-assisted journal clubs, anyone? AI-assisted supervised learning? AI-assisted professional coaching? Hypothesis generation? Wouldn't that be great? I've an analyzed this corpus, and here are some potential hypotheses. Uh, methods development, uh, promotion and tenure committees could have an AI on the side to help them make decisions, AI-assisted editing. This guy on the bottom uh, right is Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. He comments on chess tournaments using an AI, I think it's Stockfish, to look into the minds of the chess players. It's fascinating, because you can see the future through his use of the AI. It's made chess commentary much more accessible to people like me who are not really that good at chess. We could use uh, AI to create much better uh, views of the participants in the workflow. This is very typical. Poor Jay Fish here in this manuscript record, I think it was from PubMed, it's just a text string. We don't even know, have an ID for him. Uh, what his career looks like, what stage he is in his career, what he contributed to this manuscript, who he mentored, who, we, who he's a mentee for, how he's connected to institutions and funders. There's so much more value that we could be uh, adding here. Image analysis has been talked about. Gary Kasparov says the machines are coming after people with college degrees and political influence. Interesting. This is a new tool we're developing. We're going to analyze the faces of reviewers when they look at the manuscript to create automatic peer review. I'm just joking. <laughs> but maybe it'll happen one day. Um, AI can be used for audience building, improved usability. This is a, a key issue. 
one of the key pain points in manuscript submissions that authors have complained about for many years is uh, rekeying data. Well, using machine learning, we're now automatically extracting metadata from the submitted manuscript and presenting it back to the author for their validation. This outside of the workflow is useless. Built into the workflow is where the value is because you have that feedback loop where the author can validate what's gone on and the AI can learn about where it got things wrong. Um, for those of you who don't know Wonder Woman, she has a, a lasso of truth, uh, and this is going to help with identification. Uh, we're using machine learning uh, to apply identity confidence score during the peer review process based on past activity, institutional affiliation, email addresses, and the like. Statistical analysis. More than 50% of manuscripts published uh, have inadequate statistical support. Uh, so integrating an AI called Stat Reviewer uh, uh, applies thousands of algorithms on the manuscript to generate a human readable output uh, to assist with the analysis of those stats. And there are domain-specific support tools. This is for crystallography uh, validation where the, the, the relationships uh, are automatically checked. So uh, my recommendation, unless you're a large publisher, don't invest in NAI, it's hugely expensive. Be skeptical and vigilant, collaborate with partners, but do it in the workflow. You get a 10x uh, uh, return on that. Um, and look for, for and encourage your vendors to use AI. The dark side of AI, obviously it's gonna displace and we're gonna see many more people suffering from post-traumatic AI disorder. Um, there are inbuilt biases into the corpus. Uh, we have to be cognizant of those and, and maybe even adjust for them. Uh, and there are potentially uncontrolled processes with AI. And I want to leave you with a, 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 a final thought about the impact uh, of AI. I'm going to ask you, how many of you here, if I said in the next half an hour, I want you to trust your life to a thousand strangers, and they are going to make split-second decisions that will decide whether you live or die or whether you're injured. How many people would be willing to do that? Okay, more than I expected. So we do it every day. Every time we drive, we're trusting our other fellow humans. What happens when we trust machines more than humans? I think that's one of the critical questions uh, looking at AI that we have to think about. So, uh, scholarly publishers are the arbiters uh, of research quality. Uh, assertions and improving the corpus is critical. Uh, AI in workflow is the key. AI, out, AI outside of workflow is a waste of time. These are some of the people I'd like to acknowledge who helped me prepare this presentation, and thank you. <laughs>